state of the arts at Memorial Humanities and Social Sciences. Analysis whip smart and professorial smart people talk about what they know best. Listen to Lisa as she brings them all together and we try to figure out how to live together better with fat stacks of research found to impress. So let's talk about the faculty of HSS. Hi, and welcome to State of the Arts, a program that explores the research of the Faculty of the Humanities and Social Sciences at Memorial University, and how that research is critical to our changing world. My name is Lisa Moore, and we are coming to you from Memorial Center for Innovation in Teaching and Learning. It gives me great pleasure to introduce my guest today, the 2021 Writer-in-Residence, Sharon Bala. Sharon has a best-selling debut novel, The Boat People, and it won the 2020 Newfoundland and Labrador Book Award and the 2019 Harper Lee Prize for Legal Fiction. And it was shortlisted for a slew of other awards. Um, it's been translated into four languages. It's, uh, it's a magnificent novel, nothing short of that. And it's um, full of moral integrity and fantastic writing. In 2017, she won the Writers' Trust McClellan and Stewart Journey Prize for her short story, Butter Tea at Starbucks, and had a second short story listed, long listed, at the same time, which is unheard of. Uh, that's a very prestigious prize. And um, Sharon's a member of the Port Authority, which is a local writing group here in St. John's. And you can visit her at her website, SharonBala.com. But we have her here today to talk about <laughs> writing. Sharon, thank you for being here. Thank you, Lisa. So um, I want to start with talking about the boat people. Mm -hmm. um, I recently, well, at first of all, I want to start about you as a writer. Um, I recently read that George Saunders, the American writer, mm -hmm. Uh, came to writing late, uh, which I find fascinating when people come really? to it late. Yes, late in life. That's surprising because uh, he's excellent. Yes, he's brilliant. Uh, I think, you know, life must have informed every word he wrote. I think by late he said 40s. Anyway, Sweet. I'm interested in when, when people feel that they become writers mm -hmm. and then or when they are writers, when they recognize that and then when they commit to it, which means doing more than recognizing the need to tell stories, but actually doing the hard work of it. So when did that happen for you? Well, Lisa, <laughs> I don't know, you're not going to remember this. Back in 2011, you were sitting in front of me at or behind me at um, the Winterset Festival. And I was there with my husband's aunt and you turned around and we're talking to her. And I think you turned to me and said, well, what do you do? And Jane, my husband's aunt, said, well, Sharon's a writer. And I said, no, no, I just write. And you said, but you are a writer if you write, which is a thing that I have been telling other writers. And I think um, for a lot of people, they don't commit to, the, to the, the noun writer, but they commit to the verb writer, right? So they, they write, and they might have a consistent practice of writing. They might even be sending things out. They might even have short stories or nonfiction pieces published here and there. But there is something about saying, I am a writer, which feels like an act of ego, I think, when I was first starting, that I was very hesitant to sort of say it. And I remember I really only started um, referencing myself as being a writer, the noun, once I had a book deal. And once there was like a significant check coming my way, that's when I really felt like, okay, even though I think, I wish I had just said, I am a writer from the very beginning. Mm -hmm. Well, it, it, it's, there's a lot to unpack there. Yeah. <laughs> you know, we, it's not about the money though, or the book deal, is it? It's really about, well, I think it's really mm -hmm. about having that work, having that, having done a substantial work basically. And having someone acknowledge it and say, yes, yes this is good enough that we are also backing it. I agree. I agree. Yeah. Okay, so about the the bow people, mm -hmm. do you want to just tell us what this book is about? Because yeah. you can do it better than me. <laughs> it's been a while now. Uh, so the bow be people begins with the arrival of a cargo ship carrying um, 503 refugees who have fled Sri Lanka at the end of the civil war. They've arrived on the west coast of Canada on this ship and they think, okay, the worst is behind us, right? The war is behind us, this terrible journey on this rusty cargo ship. 
uh, where we're overcrowded is behind us, and now we can start our new lives. Um, at the center of the story are a young man named Mahindan and his son Selian. Selian is six, Mahindan's about 35. Um, and unfortunately, as soon as they arrive, they're separated and they're sent to separate prisons. So father is sent to um, a maximum security prison and the son is sent to a medium security women's prison where there are facilities for children. And the book follows them and some of these other refugees who've come on this ship for about a year, their first year in Canada, as they try to sort of navigate the bureaucracy and the hurdles and the law to try to really begin their lives. And so it, that is quite shocking to think about now mm -hmm. because in Canada, we were so outraged with Trump separating mm -hmm. uh, refugee parents and children. And, it, and it, was, it was already going on. And this story is based on true facts. Yeah, it was inspired by um, the, a couple of real life ships that came to Canada in 2009 and 2010, both carrying refugees who had fled the civil war in Sri Lanka. Um, and the boat that came in 2009, they were more or less, if I remember correctly, allowed to kind of get off and begin their lives. But when the second ship arrived with 492 people, the their welcome was quite different. And they really were sent to prison and um, some children really were put into foster care as what happens in the book. Um, and some of them really languished in prison for years and years and years. I remember when I was writing this book. So these events in real life happened in, it began in 2010. Uh, and when I was writing the book, it was already 2013. It was already three years out and there were people in prison. And every few months as I was working on the book, I would go and just like check online to see like, are they out? Are they finished? No, it wasn't done yet. And the most recent thing um, was in 2017, so a year before my book came out, there was a big case that went to the Supreme Court of Canada where it was three or four men who um, had been ordered to be deported and they were trying to get, it was like last ditch effort when you go to the Supreme Court of Canada, right? You're trying to get an appeal. So that just goes to show how long these things get dragged out for. Yes. Um I mean, it's it's harrowing. It's a harrowing read, mm -hmm. but at the same time, it is aesthetically like a tour de force. It's every every detail is carefully chosen, is there for a reason. The characters are multifaceted. Mm -hmm. The pacing is, you know, unput downable, and uh, even throughout, like you're you you just turn right till the end. Um, so I'm. I'm wondering if you think that, I'm wondering about the relationship of politics and fiction, mm. because not only is this a very aesthetically crafted book, it is also a, an incredibly strong political um, exploration of injustice. Mm -hmm. So do you think politics and art always go together, have to go together? Uh, I don't think you can separate politics from anything including art. And I didn't set out to write a political book. Um, and at one point I was about maybe, I don't even know, it was midway through writing the book. I was uh, walking down the street, listening to a podcast and I can't remember what the podcast was about, but the someone said the words, women don't write political books. And I thought, is that really true? And then I thought, I'm writing a political book. And that was the first, uh, that was the first time I really thought of my book as being political. So. And I think, you know, if we think about, if we think about something like um, I, in, during the lockdown, I was comfort reading a lot of uh, like classic Agatha Christie. You might not think that's political, but of course it is, right? What are the gender politics there? Who gets to be the witness who is believed versus not believed? What, it, what is the situation, like who's the killer and who's the victim? All of that is political because we exist in society and it's not divorced from politics. And people think politics means like, who's the prime minister and kind of big P politics. But the big P politics is determined by the way we vote. And what do we vote on? Issues, we vote on every issue. Even where my neighbor's fence is, of course, comes down to politics, right? Because that's municipal politics. How do we decide where the right of way is? So everything is political. I don't think that you can write anything that's divorced from politics. You might just not realize 
exactly what writing is politics. exactly and i think agatha christie are, what, what what is the name of those murder mysteries cozy mysteries yes cozy murder yeah. mysteries which yeah. means that you can relax into it without worrying about anything other than solving the puzzle right um this book is also really about race in lots of ways mm -hmm. and i wonder if agatha christie is in any way about race or although we see poirot is a refugee right like the reason he's Poirot in Agatha Christie, the reason that he is, I now know a lot about Agatha Christie because I got like really deep into it. But the reason that he is in the UK is because of the war and because he had to flee from Belgium because of the Nazis, I think. And I can't, it's like a bit fuzzy now, but yeah. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so Agatha Christie really is because apolitical is also mm. political, of course. Right. So um, one of the things that uh, Priya, a character in this book, who is a, a articling uh, student, mm -hmm. uh, a, for she's articling for a lawyer who is on the side of the refugees. Um, one of the things she says uh, is that um, you know there's a problem between the letter of the law and mm -hmm. how it gets, I think, interpreted. That's not. Is it not? It's um. not. It's there's not a, interpreted. There's like a it, gulf it's, between the letter of the law and the way that it gets kind executed. Of executed, yeah. 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 And I'm wondering if if that is the, you know, the crux of the problem of our justice system and not only our justice system, but uh, the the way we uh, process refugees mm -hmm. and if if there isn't um, room in between the letter of the law and the way it's executed for a lot of racism and a lot mm. of political um, evil, let's say. Yeah, there's definitely uh, a gap. And when it comes to refugee law, this was, I mean, that, that thing that Priya says or she thinks uh, actually just came from me because when I was researching refugee law, I was, I was reading the textbook and then I was reading um, how, I, I was reading judgments and I was thinking, there's such a gap here. And with refugee law, it's partly because it exists in this weird kind of in-between place where it's sort of administrative and the, you know, the judges who decide, the quote unquote, I'm saying the word judge, the people who decide who gets to stay and who gets to, who has to go are not really judges and they might not have any legal background at all. They're just political appointments, or at least they were at the time of the book takes place in the book and in real life. And so... You have people making judgments, life and death judgments, who are potentially have no understanding at all of the law and have no training in the law. And they might also be people who have no understanding of world politics, conflict in other places. They might not even be able to point to places on a map necessarily because they just political appointments, you know. And I was looking at the Immigration and Refugee Board, um, the adjudicators, the list of adjudicators, and uh, I was looking at their biographies, and I was thinking, huh, I could be one of these people if I knew somebody who gave me a job. Like, some of them were just lobbyists. Some of them were political fundraisers. Are, are those the people who should really be deciding on these, like, complicated issues? And then, of course, we look at um, something like a cozy murder, <laughs> Who gets, who gets um, put in prison for an assault, right? And we've seen this in St. John's, like if you're a police officer and you assault a woman during the course of duty, you're probably gonna get away with it. Whereas if you're like Joe on the street and maybe you're a working class person who doesn't have money for an expensive lawyer, you're probably not gonna get away with it. Who's the victim and who's the perpetrator? And depending on who those people are, the letter of the law could be applied differently. Yes, I mean, that's that's yeah. very well said um, and heartbreaking. Yeah. Um, would you give us a reading from, mm. from the boat people, Sharon? So I'm going to read something that I've actually, a section of the book that I've never read from uh, before. This is from the middle of the book. It's a scene called Errand. Um, and at this point, the these refugees have been in Canada for a number of months now. So Mahindan and his son Selian have been separated for a number of months. Um, and selian has been in this other prison kind of being looked after by some of the uh, women who came on the ship with some other children who were also on the ship. Um, and once a week, Priya, 
the lawyer and Charlie, the interpreter, pick him up and take him to see his father. And on this particular night, they have to do this terrible errand and they're picking him up for a different reason. Um, there's also a fleeting reference to Priya's boss, Jigavez, in this scene. And the other thing you need to know is that um, Selian has a, a very small statue of the Hindu god Ganesha that he holds onto, almost like a, it's like his stuffy, I guess, even though it's not a stuffy. Um, <clears throat> okay, errand. Charlie drove them out to the suburbs of, of Maple Ridge. Priya was incensed at being roped into this errand, Jigavez's last minute order after she'd already worked late and was just powering down her computer and anticipating takeout sushi in her pajamas on the couch, passing out to some brainless reality show. But now they were heading east on Highway 1 and she had to swallow down her umbrage so Charlie wouldn't notice. I can't believe we're doing this, Charlie fumed at the steering wheel. What's that expression you lawyers have? Cruel and unusual, Priya said, staring at her dark reflection in the window because it had struck her too. Charlie turned onto the bypass road and Priya felt the familiar dread close in, the smothering gloom that lingered around the prison, a malignant force field that tightened its grip as they neared. The women's correctional center was a gray, two-story box on neatly manicured grounds with a flagpole and a short flight of steps to the front door. But for the lack of windows, it could have been a school or a middle-tier pharmaceutical company. It struck her how punitive the name was, correctional. Charlie yanked up the parking brake and pressed the red button on her buckle so the street belt reeled back with an angry zing. Truly, she said, this can't wait until morning? Why are we spiriting the kid away in the middle of the night? Celian was half asleep and tearful when the guard brought him out, but he perked up when he spotted Charlie and hugged her hard, eyes squeezed shut. He thinks he's going to see his father, Charlie said, when they were back in the car. Priya tried to smile at Celian in the car seat, small and restrained, under the convoluted crisscross of belts and clips. Though it was after 8 p.m. and he'd been roused from his bed, he was still wearing the government-issued track pants and sweater she always saw him in during the day. Celian asked a question in his high child's voice, and Charlie replied, catching his eye in the rearview mirror. Ilya, she said, shaking her head, her head. Ilya. Priya knew this meant no. Selian bobbed his head as he replied, and the hope on his face required no translation. Priya caught the refrain, Appa, Appa. It's no use, Charlie said. He won't believe me. She blew a hard breath, fluttering her bangs off her brow. But when she spoke to Selian, her voice was cajoling, every sentence turning up at the end. What was Charlie saying? What words could she possibly find to explain where he was going and why? Priya flipped through her paperwork as they drove, reviewing the business she had to conduct with the foster parents, the forms they had to sign, an initial, the copies she must leave with them, the ones she had to take. There was a picture of the couple, Rick and Maggie Flanagan, and their bungalow in West, New Westminster. Priya twisted back and held the photos out to Celian. These are the nice people who will take care of you, she said, and Charlie translated. <clears throat> Celian clutched Ganesha to his chest and shook his mute head. There are a dozen Tamil families who would grab, gladly have taken him in, Charlie said, as she signaled to change lanes. But none of them are accredited foster parents, Priya said. She'd already had this argument with Jigavez. Haven't we learned our lesson on this, she had railed, stealing children from their native parents and putting them in white homes? What's next? A special school run by pedophiles? She'd got so worked up she hadn't even known what she was saying. A small voice inside her pleaded, for the love of God, woman, stop. But Jigavez hadn't snapped or even taken his usual condescending tone. He'd only asked, with a bemused expression, are you sure you don't want to work in refugee law? And that had shut her up. But then he had given her this assignment and she knew it was her punishment. Charlie waved an angry hand at the windshield and said, the government is going to all this trouble, jailing 500 people in the suburbs, bussing them to hearings, setting their lawyers on attack mode. They couldn't fast track a few foster parent applications and get the family certified. Priya glanced over her shoulder at Selian, wondering what he made of all of this, Charlie ranting in English and how much he understood. Imprisoned in the car seat, he sat quietly, holding Ganesha in his lap and petting his elephant head like a dog. Thank you, Sharon. That's heartbreaking. Yeah. And it comes, <clears throat> it's a, 
It's a scene that, you know, you mentioned pace and you praised the pace of the book. And this is not the book that McClelland and Stewart and Doubleday bought. And that was one of the scenes that once my editors got to it, they sort of said, so what happens between here and here? And I just started talking. I was like, oh, this happens and this happens and this happens. And they said, maybe you should go write those difficult scenes. Interesting. Yeah. So for you, this was a, a difficult scene to write or just to just you knew it would be a difficult scene to read? Uh, to write. And I figure if it's a difficult scene for me to write, it's going to be a difficult scene for the reader to read. Um, and this scene of, of a child being taken to live with foster parents who are total strangers and also don't speak his language and he doesn't speak their language um, was a difficult scene to imagine and then kind of worked out the logistics of, and then like you have to spend so much time, right? When it's a short scene, but there's so much time that goes into kind of making that scene. That was difficult and to sort of like get my head into his experience, but then also Priya's experience and Charlie's experience. And then I was thinking, well, how would you actually do this? And there's a moment, I didn't read it, but it comes next where they kind of lull him to sleep. So Priya and Charlie stay with the foster parents and they're all kind of chatting, the adults are chatting. And the child falls asleep, and then they sort of slip him into bed and try to run away, which I think is probably what I would do. Like, what else can you do? And, of course, he wakes up, and he runs, and he, he like, has to be restrained. Um, and that was difficult to write. And the scene that comes before is the scene. It's a flashback scene to his birth where his mother dies. That was even more difficult to write. And the one before that is the one where um, Mahindan is told that his son is going to be taken away from him. I, like, I'm pretty sure I wrote... I know that those, I, I wrote all those three scenes kind of after my editors made me write them. So yeah, the, like the three, there's like a little trio of very difficult scenes. And those are the scenes where I've heard from readers, like that, that was the point where they sort of broke down emotionally. Well, yeah. it is, it's interesting too that you bring up Indigenous experience in, in mm -hmm. Canada because of course it's, it's all the same story. It's the same story repeated and repeated mm -hmm. in different iterations through which there seems to be no escape. Um, yeah, completely mm -hmm. harrowing. Um, one of the things I want to ask you is, so a lot has happened since this book came out. And, uh, you know, we've, we've had the U United States go through such... Mm -hmm. We've had Black Lives Matter. We've had uh, the insurrection at the Capitol. We've had so much uh, racial tension in the States, and we've had lots of racial tension here in Canada, too. Mm -hmm. um, I'm wondering how this book has changed for you and for the audience since it was published, because books do, once mm -hmm. they're out there, they have a life of their own. Yeah, they have a complete life of their own. For me, the book hasn't changed because I am not actively involved with, and I, you know, I, I mentioned before we started that it's been a year now since I've even looked at the book, read from the book, promoted the book, because of course, during COVID, everything got canceled. Um, and it's it's sort of been nice for me because I've been able to write a different book now, but um, I, I really had to sort of, before The Boat People came out, I had this period of, I think it was nine months where my work was finished and the publishing company was taking over, and it was nine months between that and the book actually being published. And in those nine months, I sort of coached myself and said, okay, it's not your book anymore. It's not your book anymore. It's not yours anymore. Because <laughs> I think once it goes out into the world, it takes on a life of its own. And this is like, um, this is something that I know that Jessica Grant, when she was writer in residence, said that I heard. Just she said, it's, it's like the, every time someone opens the book, the characters get up on stage and they put on the play again, right? And to me, I always think, depending on the person coming to the book, that play is slightly different. And depending on when they read the book, that play is slightly different. And for me, reading other people's books, if I go back to reread a book, I, that book changes if it's a mm -hmm. good book. Because there's if, if it's a good book and the writer has done, done their job, they've left room for the reader which means a reader coming to a book in their 20s versus their 60s, is it's going to be a different book. And a reading, reader coming to a book in 2018 versus 2020 versus 2021, it's going to be a different book. So for me, the book hasn't changed because it's kind of, it's like in amber. 
But I would hope that the reader coming to it today would have a different experience than they would if they read it in 2018 when it was published. Certainly some things that have changed in the world. So I'm, I believe, I'm not totally sure about this, but I believe, so Canada had this thing called um, a safe third country agreement. If you are a refugee and you come through what is deemed a quote unquote safe country, uh, you're technically not allowed to claim refugee status and the U.S. was considered a safe country. So anyone coming through the U.S. to Canada and it just it made me so angry, especially during the Trump administration, because I thought, how can anyone pretend that's a safe country and how can our government say that's a safe country? Um, and I know there was a lot of pressure on Trudeau and I believe that they have just changed that oh, very recently. Fantastic. Yeah, I believe. Don't quote me on that. Um, and I, I think that someone also told me that, like an expert person told me that they've also changed the rules around who can be an immigration and refugee board, like a, an adjudicator, so who can do the character of Grace's job. So that would be great if that was no longer just a political appointment. Fantastic. Yeah, I hope you're right. Yeah, I hope I'm right too. <laughs> um, I want to ask you, I'm, I'm, I'm going to save a reading from the short story till the end. Mm -hmm. um, because I know we're getting short on time, but I really want to ask you about uh, the your plans for the writer in residence, mm -hmm. um, because it's a thrill for us to have you. Um, so oh, first I want to say that, um, especially when I was just getting started, the writer in residence every year was such an amazing resource for me. Like I would kind of wait and get excited when I saw who the writer was and immediately like sign up for all the workshops. Um, and so because this year uh, there's no barrier, geography is not a barrier, and all the workshops are online, I thought I would really focus on the workshops rather than the one-on-one -on -one consultations. So I'm planning four workshops, which are standalone, but of course, if I think there's a, probably something extra if you go to all four, and I've sort of um, thought of them as being building on each other. So because I believe that character is king, we're beginning with character, which I think is foundational to the story, so lay the foundation first. Um, and then the second workshop is one I'm a little bit nervous about because I, I really had sort of planned it thinking about like in real life kind of situation. Uh, but we're, what we're going to do is listen to an audio story and then along the way pause to, to take apart what, how is this story fitting together? So I'm calling it story dissection because it, it is sort of like, you know, cutting open a frog and opening it up and looking at all the parts. So, um, is this, it's a really a, a story, it's a, a workshop about story structure. So wh what are the three acts? How does the Aristotelian arc work? How does foreshadowing play? Like how can you foreshadow something at the beginning and then have it come back at the, at the end in a way that maybe um, a, a reader or a listener or a person who is um, taking in the story the first time doesn't notice, but mm -hmm. the second time be like, oh, here's something extra for me. So yeah, we're gonna listen to a, an audio story and then pause along the way to talk about it. And hopefully by the end, um, attendees will have a sense of, of structure. Then um, the third workshop is on dialogue, which I think is just the most difficult thing to teach or write. Um, and then the fourth workshop is putting it all together. So how do you revise a story? How do you revise a novel? Okay, that sounds fantastic. Yeah. And I know you're doing two in February. Two in February, one in March, one in April. Um, and they're on Thursday nights, seven to nine. And um, people can go to the English department website to get all the, uh, all the information they need about how to, how to get a link to the workshops and it's open to everyone. Yep. That sounds fantastic. And I myself am <laughs> going to be listening to those workshops. <laughs> I can't wait. Um, maybe just to close, you could give us a reading from um, Racket, which sure. is a collection of stories uh, from the Port Authority, I think. Must yes. be all Port Authority, right? And yep. Port Authority is your writing group. Yep. So there are, I think, 10 or 11 stories in here. They're all excellent. This book came out with Breakwater in 2015. And since then, a number of us have had um, our own novels out. So this is um, a reading from a story called A Drawer Full of Gugums. And this, the story takes place in 2002. The main character is Kate. She is a Canadian. She's living in London, England during a master's in art history. And her project is about these two artists who lived, real artists who live in the 1800s called um, Dante Gabrielle Rossetti and Lizzie Sedal. <clears throat> 
In Bloomsbury, there were spiked iron fences around the parks and Georgian townhouse blocks, their windows stacked up in neat lines, a fan of glass above each glossy blue door. We are respectable and bourgeois, the houses said. We only drink single malt. Kate had spent the evening at the British Library skimming old correspondence and journals. She had stumbled on a diary entry by Rossetti's sister who had gone to visit his studio and found it papered with sketches of Lizzie. Rossetti is every day with his sweetheart of whom he is more foolishly fond. The moon drifted in and out of sight, hidden behind the clouds. Foolishly fond. Kate repeated the line to herself as she walked, full of satisfaction, a solid day of research come to a close. Cutting diagonals through the laneways, she felt like a local. The weekend before, she had taken Nisha's advice and bought a matinee ticket. She had sat by herself in a row full of strangers and been thrilled by Colin Firth's proximity, the unadulterated crispness of his voice. Afterward, she had gone to the South Bank Christmas market, eaten currywurst out of a paper doily in dainty bites, and waved to the children on the carousel while Big Ben chimed six. She had drunk a little bit too much mulled wine and felt quietly exuberant on the true to bride home. This is what Kate was learning. In London, it was possible to be alone and not lonely. She had taken to navigating without a map and felt intrepid and brave even though she knew she wasn't. Bloomsbury Square to Great Russell Street, the British Museum, too far north. She heard the footsteps of the person behind her as she doubled back, sneakers lethargic against pavement and an ambulance in the distance. There were reeds hung on doors. Through the windows, she caught glimpses of stockings on mantels and twinkling Christmas lights. Fog blurred the lamplight. This was Jack Ripper's London. A mini parallel parked between two Peugeots. The bumpers kissed and the driver jumped out, engine still running, to scrutinize the damage. At the streetlight, a man in a suit, trouser leg tucked into a sock balanced on a cycle. Two women jogged past, lycra and reflective tape, and then for a long stretch, she was alone. Kate veered onto a street that was walled in on both sides. She had taken a wrong turn somewhere. Everything was still except the footfalls behind her, the same lazy rhythm as before. The street name at the corner was one she did not recognize. Kate reached into her pocket and held onto her keys, forming her hand into a fist with the biggest key sticking out between two fingers. She told herself, don't panic. High Holborn was nearby. Was it north or south? She listened for traffic or pedestrian voices, but all she heard were two sets of footsteps. She walked a little faster, with purpose as Cosmo had taught her. She swung her arms. The back of her neck burned. She took stock. She was wearing a peacoat, a belt, jeans with buttons, not a zipper. Okay, she mustn't freak out. She mustn't look back. Did the footsteps have a gender? Possibly it was a granny with a headscarf. She heard a whistle and a rabble of voices up ahead. Yes, the high street must be just around this corner. The blood in her ears was the sound of her own panic. If she could just get to a crowded place. She turned left into a deserted alleyway, and then it was too late. <sighs> Thank you, Sharon. <laughs> um, that... Uh, Again, you know, a, a reading just full of tension. And also, you know, here there's a tremendous amount of tension that all women feel walking mm -hmm. alone in the dark. Mm -hmm. um, but that story is so rich and deep with so many different themes. And uh, I hope everybody will go buy <laughs> Racket. <laughs> it's uh, it's uh, published by Breakwater Books. And it is a, a fantastic collection. And the rest of that story is amazing. Um, so thank you, Sharon. And Thanks, um, I want to say that uh, I want to say a big thank you to uh, to John Bunnell and Philip Cairns, uh, Paul Hayward, Ben Smith, Donna Downey and Terry Coles. And a special thank you to Jennifer Simpson, the Dean of the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences, and to Jennifer Lokash, who is the head of the English department and, you know, keeps us all producing fantastic literature and reading it. Uh, and uh, the Visiting Writers Committee, uh, Chris Lockett, Rob Finley, Jamie Skidmore, Bill Skipper, and Sharon King Campbell, and Eddie Dust, and Kaylin Smith. And most of all, perhaps, <laughs> thank you to the viewers. State of the arts at 
Memorial Humanities and Social Sciences. Analysis whip smart and professorial smart people talk about what they know best. Listen to Lisa as she brings them all together and we try to figure out how to live together better with fat stacks of research found to impress. So let's talk about the faculty of HSS. Thank you.